today all about exploring how your own health is so intricately linked to the health of the environment as well. And joining me today are two gentlemen who know just an incredible amount about that today. I am joined by Dr. Neil Barnard. Dr. Barnard, thank you so very much for being here. Hi there, Chuck. And our very special guest today is Kip Anderson. He is a writer and producer known for Cowspiracy, the smash documentary from 2014, and now more recently, Seaspiracy. Kip's films follow his journey to find solutions to the most pressing environmental issues. Now, in Cowspiracy, if you recall, Kip took on animal agriculture, which is the most single destructive industry facing the planet today. And that film, it investigated why the world's leading environmental organizations are too afraid to talk about that. And now with Seaspiracy, he has turned the focus on to the oceans and what humans are doing to marine species. So with that, let's welcome Kip Anderson to the show. Thank you so very much for being here, Kip. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. After the huge success that you saw with Cowspiracy, I'm curious why you did uh, decide to turn your attention and focus on the oceans. Well, you missed one where there was a big one called What the Health that actually Dr. Bernard was in. That was a massive, even bigger hit. Uh, the timing was perfect. Um, so it was really about first of the environment, then looking at the health aspects of it and how the ties, not only the government and the lobby groups, but this pharmaceutical industry as well and how those, those collude. But when we're making cowspiracy, each one of those topics that we go into fishing and uh, grass-fed beef and organic and dairy, each one of those could be a film. And especially when we were doing oceans, you could really tell there's a lot more to this. And then uh, meeting Allie and Lucy, Allie was already working on something with that inspired by cowspiracy and we said, hey, Let's make this an entire film. It deserves an entire film, as you can see uh, by the Seaspiracy. That it's that that alone is a ninety minute film. That could have been four hours. There's so much information to be discussed about the film and our the impacts of our uh, what fi eating fish and fishing industry does to the planet and our health as well. No question. It's amazing how much you were able to fit in that 90 minute window. Uh, how long did it take you to piece this together? And what were some of the highlights of your investigation? Wow, it took a, it took a four and a half years. It's, you know, with documentaries, a lot of it, the filming is the easy part. You're investigating things coming from a very authentic place of let's just discover everything. And then once you have everything out, like, wow, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of information and interviews and to piece that together and to have a story arc and to make it exciting and make it, you know, so the mainstream people will watch it, not just say vegans or something. It is a real challenge. A documentary film editor, you know, that's about 90% of what documentary films do. Very different than narrative films. So it took about four and a half years. And the most shocking, I think, you know, while we were making is the things, you know, after four and a half years, a lot of these things were popping up. The climate change, uh, about where, how, how much kelp forest impacts, you know, the carbon sink of oxygen compared to, say, the Amazon rainforest. They, these things, that's why it was good. Looking back, we were trying to rush the film, but more, more information came out. So it was all very meant to be because... As we kept on with this journey, more information from the scientific world actually started coming out about how impactful the ocean is to an entire ecosystem of the environment. And Dr. Barnard, I think that that probably hits home for you as well. We're talking about four and a half years to put together a single project. I know you are so heavily involved in so many of these studies that come out looking at nutrition, and those get boiled down to really a few sheets of paper. But you, your team at the Physicians Committee have poured also years of hard work into putting that out. Well, that's true. Any project you, that you want to do do well with, um, you want to give it the attention and time that it needs. And I want I want to say a huge thank you to Kip for his incredible work um, on on all the movies, but this one in particular. I have to say, when people watch this movie, um, several things happen. Some of which you've touched on already. They start thinking about the environment. They start thinking about um, the fisheries, and and the, but I think more than that. A couple of things beyond that. One is that they start feeling that they might have been misled. Um, so many people have the idea that fish is this healthy thing. And I don't think anybody could emerge from watching Seaspiracy without thinking this is really 
a just terribly unhealthy partly partly it's you know, there's fat and cholesterol and the usual thing that people pretend aren't in fish but just the dirt and the fifth uh, filth um, that the fish are ingesting in the in the increasing increasingly dirty environment that they're in and one other thing i think you've done something that i have never seen any other film do which was to help people to take one more step even in their ethical thinking I mean, kind of the same way as Jane Goodall said, okay, chimpanzees aren't just cute little fuzzy animals wearing suspenders in a movie. Um, they have cultures. And you left people thinking, fish are you know, persons too in their own way. And that's an uncomfortable thought for a lot of people, um, whether they're working in a restaurant or cooking up something in their kitchen. But I think that is such a wonderful thought. Um, and part of what I like about it is that if people will start thinking about fish, you know they're going to think about everybody else, too. So I just love that about your film. And well, Kip, thank you. how how was it for you to strike that balance between what Dr. Barnard was talking there about the ethical impact versus the health impact? There, you cover both really so so well in the film. Were you going for a 50-50 balance there, or going into it, were you just going to let it play out how you saw fit? Well, it is all about a balance. And that's why it took four and a half years is the editing balance of what, you know, what's most impactful, what will create most, uh, most difference, you know, transformation when people watch this. We really wanted to actually fish sentience, the, as, as Dr. Bernard was saying, is something that's really personal to me and that we actually wanted to have another five to 10 minutes, which is in film world, 90 minutes, another, you know, that's, that's a lot of time. Because it's just so, you could just, you know, if you watch, um, you know, David Attenborough's, um, you know, their documentaries, how incredible fish are. I mean, you know, people have probably watched My Octopus Teacher. And it's just like, wow, look at this is so amazing. It's like, well, yes, all the fish, you know, all the fish in the ocean are. They all have their own personalities and their own network and their own communities and families and how they work. So it's something we wanted to uh, explore more. But again, with 90 minutes, we had to balance the ethical environmental side, the ethics on just eating these incredible animals or not, and then the health impacts. So it's a delicate balance. And, um, you know, I recommend watching or reading a book called What a Fish Knows. And Jonathan Balcombe is in the film. He is one of the first, if not the first book that's ever really been written dedicated to solely on the sentience of fish. And it's called What a Fish Knows. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a great read. And there's a especially impactful moment in the film toward the end uh, during, a, I believe it was a, a whale hunt. It was a community got together and it, it just essentially the only way to describe this was was a mass slaughter. And you, you see this sea of red and it really struck me. You're talking about the personalities of these animals, but then not only are, you know, is there that really shocking moment to, to see all of that carnage, but then to know that from a health standpoint, not only, are, you know, are, are we doing this, uh, the, the violence there, but then you, you go home and, and then you eat this. And then what you also linked in the film, perhaps more so than we even knew going in was that this is really, really harmful to our health as well. Yeah, and I think Dr. Bernard can <laughs> elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, but it's definitely not healthy. And that's another section in, in, in What the Health. We expand on that a little bit more in What the Health, I think. But I mean, I'd love to hear what Dr. Bernard says about the yeah. health or unhealth of that. Well, you know, I, your timing couldn't have been better, I have to say, because we had just uh, shortly before you released your film, we had released a study comparing a Mediterranean diet to a vegan diet. And as you know, on the Mediterranean diet, you're not eating so much beef, but you're having fish and it's grilled fish and the low fats, that kind of stuff. Um, and so many people imagine, you know, uh, a Mediterranean diet is as good as vegan, but easier to follow. So we put it to the, to the test. Um, and we had individuals follow a vegan diet for 16 weeks, then switch to a Mediterranean for another 16 weeks. The same people did both. And others did it in the opposite direction. And the findings were astounding. Um, the, the, the vegan diet caused weight loss just as you'd expect. Um, but on the Mediterranean diet, the weight loss after 16 weeks was 0, 0.0 pounds, nothing. Um, the drop in cholesterol was really, really trivial. Um, there, was an, there was an improvement in blood pressure, which is good to see. Um, but by and large, the conclusion of the study is published in the, the um, a Journal of the College, uh, uh, the American College of Nutrition. Um, 
The bottom line from the study was that if a person is trying to lose weight or, or improve their cholesterol, that a Mediterranean diet, eat, switching from beef to fish, is a complete clinical mistake. It just doesn't work at all. So that came out. Around the same time, my octopus teacher was coming out. People think, oh, gee, maybe there is somebody inside there. And then your film uh, expands all that a little bit. Um, if you don't mind, I, th I think the other thing I liked about what your, your film was, so many people will say, don't use a straw, plastic straw. That's going to contribute plastic to the ocean. And, and that's a good idea to not use a straw. But when what you talked about with what nets and the other trash that comes out of this industry does to the ocean, I don't think anybody can ever walk on the beach again. And you look at the fishing lines and the, the, the um, uh, nets and, and that kind of thing. And you just see, you could just imagine what's happening out uh, offshore. Yeah, well, as we say, the analogy of, uh, yeah, well, we shouldn't probably have toothpicks either, just protect the Amazon. So it's like one of those, it's like we, the, the data shows it's 0 0.003 uh, of what plastic is in the ocean. And, oh, it's just no comparison. So it's just one of those things where, you know, a lot of, it's called seaspiracy as cowspiracy has the spirit, conspiracy, you know, feel to it. But to, you know, the defense of most people, you know, everyone means to do well. It's, it, we feel that not using straws was the gateway to actually this film, you know, like this is why it was a perfect opportunity for this film because it was kind of a gateway. Now people know about this, let's protect the ocean, let's move, move plastic. So it was all perfect lead up to this film. Well, if you want to really uh, remove plastic, this is what we need to do. And not only this is what we need to do, this is why we need to do it. I think before people like, we need to take plastic straws out, it might save some turtles. Well, in reality, if you look in the mirror, it's mostly like because we want to keep our oceans, our beaches clean to, to swim in Bali and stuff. But in reality, when you're looking at the impact that how many dolphins and turtles and horrific deaths it kills, then not only do we know that we need to take plastic where it comes from, but also really why we need to take plastic um, out of the ocean. That's really protect those who live there. And I think people weren't imagining that all of these nets and these cast off bits of trash were actually just made of, of plastic, huge, massive amounts of plastic all drifting around in the ocean. The other thing I liked is that, you know, people tend to think of fish as this healthy food. And I think they, they're gonna come out of seaspiracy and they're gonna think, wait a minute, it's mercury, it's PCBs, it's dioxins, and that spells in cancer in adults and, and birth defects in children. Um, and you, you, you just can't leave the film without thinking about that fact. And then you go to the store and Chuck and I, you and I were talking about this before, just before we went to air, on um, the fact that now the market is wide open for all the alternatives um, in the same way as you've got veggie burgers and veggie bacon and so forth. I noticed Gardein has this fishless filet that you put a little vegan mayo on there and it tastes like fish, but it doesn't have any mercury, doesn't have PCBs, it doesn't have any pollution, nobody fed it antibiotics, you know, so the, the world, the world is changing. And I, I, I'm so delighted that this film came out when it did. Yeah, matter of fact, there was just a report released by the Good Food Institute that looked at the alternative meat and seafood marketplace, and it showed that uh, alternative meat sales are outpacing alternative seafood sales by a ratio of 99 to 1. So there's still not a whole heck of a lot of awareness that there are, in fact, plant-based options out there, like you were just talking about, Dr. Barnard. They are readily available in your, uh, in your grocer's freezer, uh, if you would like to give them a try. Um, Kip, I want to ask you, a couple of, of words uh, popped off in the last couple of minutes that made my ears perk up. Uh, one, uh, the word conspiracy, and two, talking about the large nets. And one of the things in the film that you were able to do was to go into the offices of that organization responsible for those little blue check marks on the sides of the cans of tuna that says essentially, hey, this tuna is dolphin safe. But what you showed is that essentially that check mark is nothing but clever marketing. How, how in the world is it that they have been so successful in being able to pull the wool over the consumer's eyes and have so many people believing that the product that they are purchasing was in fact safe and did not catch a whole herd of dolphins and sea turtles along with the tuna that they were eating. Well, it's kind of like the uh, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. It's kind of, I think 
you know, it's an interesting psychological question is, is that I think people want to believe it. You know, they want to believe it. They, oh, it's got a dolphin safe fluid. I don't want to ask any more questions. It's got the label. I can eat my tuna. No one, no one really wants to know that it doesn't mean anything. They truly want to really believe like, oh, you know, this does help. And so it's really disheartening for people when they find out it, it doesn't. And it's really just kind of like these other films that we make. It's just no one really asks these hard, difficult questions. And you can tell by the people who answer them, they've never been asked them because they're just shocked. They don't even know how to answer. I mean, the lady, the funniest, one of the funniest answers in the whole film is the lady in Oceana, who we interviewed for Cowspiracy, the exact same question to a T, what is sustainability? And she says, that's a really good question. No one's ever asked what sustainability is, like what, what sustainable fishing is. Like what? No one has ever asked you that. So it's just kind of like they, 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 most people kind of stick in the groups of, lack of a better word, ignorance, and just kind of like ignorance is bliss. And let's not ask too many questions because let's stay in our nice, comfortable bubble where everything is okay. But, you know, sometimes you have to kind of poke and provoke and find out the truth, even though it's not what everyone wants to hear. You talk about- I have to think when you use the word sustainability, I, I think you've really touched on, on something. Nobody knows what it means. It doesn't mean anything particularly good when you really just um, dissect it because do we want this industry to be sustained and sustained and sustained so that you have more nets cast into the, the water, pulling up target species and trash species uh, together? Do you, do you want to continue to have the amount of cholesterol and fat and chemicals in our diet? Do we really want to sustain that? I don't think so. Um, and so I'm thinking the, the, when you go into a restaurant, they say our, our fish are sustainably accessed. Um, you think <laughs> it, it just seems like an oxymoron. The other word that I want to purge from the English language if I can is seafood. Um, it's a, I think it's okay to say fish and shellfish, but we don't talk about land food or air food. And the idea that these animals are reduced to being seafood. Yeah. I think I'm gonna erase that. Yeah. I know. So the new word is sea life. You know, I think that's life, the transformation, sea life. That's what I've seen, especially since the film coming out, a lot of people saying that because, yeah, it's so sad. Seafood, like, come on. These are incredible animals. So <laughs> I want to go back to the sustainability. I'm going to put that word in quotes, sustainability uh, conversation there for a little bit. I think that if anybody does want to hazard a guess as to what that is I think that there is a, a perception or at least a leap that they could make to uh, farm raised fish. You did a lot with farm raised salmon in the film. And I, you know, I was really struck by just the mass. Essentially, would I be accurate in describing these fish farms as just giant cesspools? <laughs> I mean, you're not far off. And you know, it's one of those things, you know, that's one of those we wanted to get in Cowspiracy of because at that time, fish farms were kind of getting the new, that's the new sustainable. It's like, wait, hold on a second. Fish eat fish. <laughs> like, there's no matter where you, where you get around it, fish are eating fish. Whether you put them in here, you put them in the ocean, no matter what, they have to be fed other fish. So, so fish farming is just such a, oh, geez, what a, what a, what a bunch of, I don't say BS, but <laughs> um, it, it's just not, it was just ridiculous once you kind of just investigate how ridiculous it is and how much fish, I think it's five pounds of fish going to fish feed to produce one pound of farm raised fish. Or, I mean, I think Dr. Bernard, you'd know for how much, how many, and it's so sad to even think of fish as pounds, how many lives of fish, but how much fish goes into a gram of fish oil that people think is healthy. And they're just squeezing all this life out of the ocean but it's just so incredibly inefficient, even more so than I'd say land animals. One of the numbers that has jumped out at me is um, it relates to this, the health aspect, is people will, will imagine that fish are, they've got to be healthier than beef at least, right? Uh, but if you look at the numbers, if you compare, say, some beef, take, a, take, take 100 grams of beef, it's got 3.4 grams of saturated fat. That's the bad fat. And you take the same amount of black beans. It doesn't have 3.4 grams. It's got 0 0.1 grams of bad fat. So then you say fish. Is fish more like the 3.4 grams of bad fat in beef, or is it more like the 0 0.1 in beans? And the answer is you take Chinook salmon, exact same size serving, and it's got 3.2 grams of saturated fat, almost identical to beef. You think, all right, well, how about cholesterol? 
uh, that serving of cholesterol, or that serving of beef had 83 milligrams of cholesterol. The black beans, zero. So where's some salmon? Is it a low cholesterol food, high cholesterol food? It's actually two milligrams higher than beef at 85 milligrams of cholesterol in the, in the serving. So anyway, this, this whole idea that that's gonna be the cleanest form, the healthiest form, I think luckily now we've got the numbers to help people realize that when they go to beans and grains and vegetables and fruits, the healthier foods, they really in fact pay off in a bigger way than people have imagined. And Dr. Bronner, one of the questions that we get asked most frequently on the exam room is if I'm not going to eat fish, how in the world do I get my omega-3s? Really quickly, can you give us some good ideas for plant-based omega-3 sources? Sure. Um, I mean, the simple things that everyone has heard about are things like chia seeds and flax seeds and so forth. You grind them up and they have omega-3. But let me mention two that might be surprises. One is your basic green vegetables. You wouldn't think there's any fat in there at all, but you send broccoli to a lab and they'll tell you, it's about seven or 8% of its calories come from fat and a surprisingly large amount is omega-3. So that's true for, for all the greens if you eat a lot of them. Um, the other surprise is that you can go to the health food store and they got fish oil capsules and it's got DHA and EPA, which you read about in the magazine, it's good for your brain. Right next to it is DHA and EPA, vegan sourced. And you can go online and you can order them. One has fish, one doesn't. Um, and so I'm not saying you need to supplement them, but for people who are looking to do that, um, there, there is simply no reason to use the fish product, whichever way you go. And Kip, before we talk about the three-part solution uh, that you and your team have put together to save the ocean, I want to ask you uh, about overfishing, which is another uh, overarching theme of the film Seaspiracy. Um, could you talk about how much fish is actually being caught every year and how much longer we can sustain that rate without getting to a point of no return, essentially? Well, the numbers are all over the place because as you see in the film, there's so much illegal fishing and there's so much illegal, uh, not illegal, but bycatch that is tossed out. And so much of this isn't even ever, uh, you know, not equated. So these are all just complete guesstimates, but it's around 1.5 trillion. I think this is the last number, 1.5 trillion pounds, which is a very sad way of counting fish. But um, recently... Uh, I was looking into how many fish lives are, are killed. And I think it's around, I think it was 2.7 trillion, 2.7 trillion fish lives, which in land animals is around 70, 80 billion. So I think it's, it comes around 40 times as many as that uh, of, of human lives killed on a yearly basis. I mean, it's just, just complete little slaughtering of entire of species on species. So these numbers are so beyond comprehension that it's just, I mean, I don't even know what to say. You just can't even put these into words other than comparing to them to human lives. Human lives, we have 70 billion lives, 70 billion next to 2.5 trillion, you know, and then the world entire over killed over and over and over on a yearly basis is just, oh, it's horrific. And then what's that doing to our oceans that we rely on for our environmental uh, sustainability future? It's just mind boggling. And let's talk about that three part solution uh, that you have put together to save the ocean. Let's kind of go in reverse order from what you have uh, listed on your website. And so the thing that I'm going to put at the top of the list that I find extremely interesting is you're calling for an end to fish subsidies. How much of the fish a fish industry is being subsidized every year? I would imagine it is in the tens of billions of dollars. Yes, it is. And it's in the film. I think it was 40 billion, some 40 billion or something. And it was something where it relates to the amount of that's spent on, on, on world hunger. And it's just, um, you know, we, we say the same thing as Dr. Bernard knows of, 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 of when you take away subsidies for, for, for land animal meats for like I say a Big Mac, it costs around $4. It really should be taking subsidies away. It would be 12 or $13. And the same goes for fish. These industries, these meat-based, animal-based uh, industries would collapse probably without these subsidies. The pork industry loses money every year. All these industries lose money. The, the fishing industry is losing money, yet we're promoting by putting trillion, you know, billions and billions of dollars in for what? 
for what? And it, you know, people say, oh, it's sustaining so many people's jobs. It's not in the, in the grand picture of things. There's so many things that this money could go towards that would be sustainable and more impactful for creating jobs. And so essentially, just to break this down, a subsidy that, that is a government payment. So basically, if you're paying taxes, you are, in fact, supporting the fish industry. Am I correct in assuming that? Yes, no matter if you eat fish or not, you are supporting this industry, sadly enough. And Dr. Barnard, we have talked extensively in the past about uh, Dairy Management Inc., the dairy's uh, big lobbying industry. And that, too, is another industry that is heavily subsidized. Just curiously, uh, with, if we took away the subsidies from the dairy industry, would we see that severe inflation, just like what Kip was talking about with the fish industry? Well, sure, sure. And some of the subsidies are sort of hidden. They're things you wouldn't think about. It's... Um the feed grain that goes into the cow. Um, if that's subsidized, if you're trying to make cheese, what's your biggest cost? It's the, the stuff that goes in the front end of the cow so that you get the milk out. Um, and so if the feed grains are heavily subsidized, um, it's a much cheaper thing. Also with regard to inspections, fish is in a bit of an unusual situation where the inspection is split um, between the FDA, which does look at, um, at the sort of the hazard points in fish processing. Um, and within the Department of Commerce, they have a voluntary program, which is really kind of there to make the fish look good, um, that you can, uh, you can sign up as a fish producer and, and show that you are um, voluntarily uh, subjecting yourself to, to uh, processing and get kind of a seal of approval in kind of the same way as Kip was describing earlier with the environmental, and the sort of pseudo environmental programs talking about sustainability. So all of these things are government programs that are designed really to help to help the industry. And Kip, number two on your list is enforce no catch marine reserves to protect 30 percent of the oceans by the year 2030. Can you talk to us a little bit about what a no catch reserve is and why that 30 percent number is so significant here? Well, 30 percent, you know, it's a 20 by 20, 30, 30 percent. Um, this is a significant number. It's a significant number because a lot of the things that these 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 uh, of the ocean. Um, I mean, that's a significant number. If you, you might have some data on that of why it's more. The other thing about why that's realistic too is that I just want to mention the technology. Some people say, well, what this is is you know, thirty percent of the ocean is massive to protect. So it's basically a sanctuary for fish life to repopulate and regroup. So you can't do fishing. And in the past, up until now, it was virtually impossible to police this. But there's some exciting new techn technology between satellites, one of the, some good things with satellites, and drones, and that we're being able to um, catch illegal fishing. And so this is a very realistic thing that by 2030, that we will be able to protect 30% of the ocean, which is massive. That's a huge first step, a massive first step in the right direction. And I'm assuming that this is a, uh, a real international effort with a lot of various countries having to work together, correct? It is. It's almost like a UN type of thing. They have to agree on this to all come together because the waters are international waters. No one technically you know, owns them. So it's a global thing that has to be agreed on. And that's what's great about this film. It's a very huge international hit that's creating a lot of, a lot of discussion all around and people are pressuring their local government. So you know, one of these cop, uh, these 21s with the environmental groups, it's going to be a big discussion that this has to be done. And the last uh, of the three um, suggestions here to save the ocean is one that our members are just going to do backflips over, and that is adopting a plant-based diet. So brass tax me here, if we saw, say, 50% even of the world's population adopt a plant-based diet, what would the net effect be on the health of the oceans? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know the exact, you know, numbers, but well, it'd be, you know, cut in half, you know, cut in half of the of amount of fish are being uh, uh, raised in fish farms and killed, which trickles down to this domino effect, uh, trickles down to um, less of these giant trawling nets being wiped across the ocean floor, destroying all these kelp forests, that stopping cutting potentially in half which is more of a carbon sink than the entire Amazon forest, all the rainforest put together on the planet. 
So all these things will have a domino effect of 50%, even if it's 20%, will have a massive, massive impact on, on the rehabilitation of the ocean and the fishes coming back to life. And Dr. Barnard, lots of upside to adopting a plant-based diet, also trickling down to the health of us here uh, as humans. Um, what would you say would be the effect on the rate of chronic disease if one out of every two people worldwide were to eliminate seafood, eliminate meat, eliminate dairy from their diet? Well, the effect would be enormous. I mean, we'd save a heck of a lot of money. Doctors could probably take half the week off because, it, <laughs> because people would be healthier. But I have to say, Chuck, I really think one, perhaps the best thing about that is that people make their dietary decisions for the most part not just by something they learn or something they read or even what's good for their health. A, a, a big motivator is what's around them. Um, so if, if you never met anybody who is following a vegan diet, um, the likelihood of your feeling comfortable adopting it's pretty, pretty, pretty low. But when other people are starting to do it, you think, yeah, yeah, maybe I could do it. And I remember maybe it was maybe 15 years ago when we were recruiting for research studies, I started to find a lot of people coming into our studies because they had a friend who was already vegan or their daughter was vegan or their cousin was vegan. So even if the whole world isn't doing this all at the same time, the more people who are, they have a growing influence on everybody around them. And so for every restaurateur, every waiter, every, every grocer who has the person coming in and asking for the meatless, whatever it is, meatless meal or something, that's a big influence on them because you're, you're creating in them an understanding that a large proportion of the population wants this change. And of course, now we're seeing it with uh, two big groups that you know intimately, Chuck. Those are athletes and, and celebrities in general. Uh, Lewis Hamilton <laughs> won the Grand Prix last Sunday, um, big vegan, and then uh, Venus Williams, and all the others are doing that. So anyway, to long-winded answer to a great question, what, what if half the people go vegan, the other half are gonna follow? And uh, as we kind of wrap things up here, I wanted to make sure that we got in a question from one of our great members, Dr. Brooke Broussard. Um, and Kip, she wrote in this question specifically for you. She wants to know what is the next step we should be taking? How can we increase the awareness of the situation that we're facing here? Well, I think a big one is share the film, which people are doing. Um, you know, you have such power now with technology of just being kind of an online activist. <laughs> You can really do a lot by sharing information, writing blogs, going on other, you know, Oceanas, these other environmental and ocean groups that need to be protecting our ocean and really put the pressure on. And you can do this from your home. You can be basically a couch activist where you couldn't do this before. So you can do a lot, you have a lot of powerful um, activism you can do, do with, you know, not much money and just on your own. And then the other thing is to, I think a big thing is to join groups. I think Bernard, Dr. Bernard would say, anytime you're making this transition where it's going vegan or you want to you create some um, you know, difference is to get a community, you know, get a community, get a team. We have a change.org uh, petition where it's up to, we want to get to a million signatures of, of getting our local, uh, of getting the global government to, to make sure we, we protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. And that's not that's done by you know getting together groups of people on on the same mission, and so when one person doesn't think they can make a difference, there's a meme I saw recently where it says, "I can't make a difference." I just said one person times three uh, times eight billion people. You know, if everyone eight billion people preached to have that reverse that I do make a difference times eight billion, then we just you know the power of the people is more powerful than it's ever been in, in, in the history of time and thanks to, to uh, technology. Yeah, the power of the people. You see how many people have watched this film right now. You see how many people are signing their name to that petition. And Dr. Barnard, I know that that gives me a great sense of optimism. I'm sure that it does for you as well. No question about it. Um, that is what you're left with after you see your film and, and the others that you have done. Um, every single one gets people thinking, gets some of them, gets half of them delighted and the other half get angry. And that is exactly what you need. So hats off to you, Kip. And, and Kip, I want to just thank you so very much for taking the time to join us today and for putting together this just phenomenal film. And it's just been so great to talk to you for the last half hour. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me and love all the work that you all do. And so we're all doing it together. Thank you so much.
If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.